elsewhere in the world. But particularly here on the show today, we are going to concentrate on the uh, status of continued learning during the coronavirus pandemic, leaving no one behind. That is the theme for the show today. Remember, at the height of the coronavirus pandemic, the, go the government instituted a lockdown. But after the lockdown, we realized that so many uh, students were running amok on the streets at home with nothing to do. So government revised a plan, a national framework from the Ministry of Education in partnership with the National Curriculum Development Center. They came up with a framework that will keep our students busy. So we are here to interrogate the implementation of that phase, yes, the framework on education. Has it had the desired effect on our children during this lockdown? Has it uh, had the desired effect on our children? That is the $64,000 question that is going to be answered by Patrice Sembirigay. He is the curriculum specialist at the National Curriculum Development Center. He joins me right now in studio and he's also joined by Safina Nakulima, who is the program's officer at the uh, Initiative for Social and Economic Rights right there. Thank you very much for having made the time to speak to NTV and for joining us. Thank you. All right, Patrice, I'm going to start with you. The lockdown has been very lengthy. Yesterday we thought maybe the president would mm, make away with the lockdown. We would see the whole complete removal of the lockdown, maybe reopening of the schools and so forth. But as it is, the status quo has been maintained. Schools are still closed. What do you make of all this in the midst of this chaos, Mr. Patrice? our dear moderator um, my name is patrice and uh, good morning viewers um the schools are still closed mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it's not in here that they are going to be opened uh, and uh, we are looking at our students who are at home and uh, we are looking at the education career and we are looking at their right to education and we are wondering how do we help them to go through this tough situation First and foremost, uh, at the Ministry of Education and the NCDC, mm -hmm. we realized that there should be continued learning. The students should continue learning, regardless of the pandemic crisis, which is global. And uh, we resorted to developing a framework to guide the process, to guide how the students would be reached in their different locations, how they could, they could continue learning. And this framework uh, entailed quite a number of issues, especially focusing on um, remote learning. So we did consider uh, developing remote learning materials, um, which would be shared among all the learners in their respective environments and locations. So we focused on the print version, the self-study, which is, would be in hard cap form, and then the radio and video lessons. So in the, that was the first phase. And in the first phase, we are focusing on what the students had covered during the time when they were at school. They were approximately at school for about six weeks, and uh, they were covering term one's work for 2020. And many schools had not gone very far, and many of them had not even done an assessment. So in our first phase, we developed the remote learning materials focusing on the content which had been covered for the first six weeks. And we did look at the categories of learners. That's lower primary, primary to primary three, then upper primary, P4 to primary seven, lower secondary, senior one to senior four, and then upper secondary, which is A level, senior five and senior six. So our materials <coughs> focused on those levels. And NCDC, National Cultural Development Center, took the lead to develop these materials. These materials were standardized in a way that we had to follow our procedures that we use when we are developing materials for schools. And when these materials were developed, uh, now we had to find a way of distributing them to all the students, wherever they are. 
But <clears throat> to remind you a bit, this was uh, an emergency. So as we were grappling with this challenge, we were not so much prepared for it as, a, as, as uh, the education sector that now we have so much in our basket, resource envelope to cater for that. So when we were developing the materials, yes. we had to consider that fact that now we are having, we are focusing on 12 million students who are out there and printing materials worth that population was not easy because there was no budget which was clearly allocated for that emergency. Mm -hmm. So we did our best and uh, developed the materials, printed them, we did the radio scripts, did record them, we did the television and yeah, we had lessons on television, we had le lessons on radio, we had the printed or the hard copies distributed. Let's talk about the effectiveness of this whole process, Mr. Patrice Sembirige. Some students within the border districts say that they do not get the signal from the city centers or from the Ugandan radio stations. They are getting signals from the border, neighboring border countries. Don't you think such a group has been left out? And another issue, have you circulated all these learning materials from the framework to all learners in the country? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, the network, mm. connectivity. It's quite a challenge, especially when you are at the countryside. Uh, the materials we developed first and foremost did not reach all the 12 million students. Because we, we, it was 25% uh, that was the target. Mm -hmm. Reason I've given that there was a financial consequence, so we couldn't really reach out to all the students who are out there. So that's why we had to use different modes. The first mode was the hard copy material, which really did not reach every student because of the financial difficulties. And then the, the other mode was the radio and then the television and those who had the connectivity with the internet, whatever, they would use their mobile phones. To answer your question, the students at the border, they normally pick uh, from other countries the network. So did we really help them? When, we when we was, the, the materials were being distributed, we were focusing on, on the far child, those who are marginalized and vulnerable, those at the countryside first, they were given first priority, focusing on uh, the children who could, cannot have access to television, who not have access to internet. So we, we had an assumption that the hard material would bridge the gap, and the radio and TV was, those were additionals. Mm -hmm to cater for those who would have access. All right, let me also bring in uh, Na um, Nakulima Safina, the program's officer at the Initiative for Social and Economic Rights. L let's talk about the framework itself. Um, the Ministry of Education framework on continued learning, do you think it is pro-poor? Does it speak to the rich or the poor? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the framework on continued learning from the assessment mm -hmm. and from the monitoring that we've done as the initiative for social and economic rights because we have community advocates in different districts like Kayunga, Buyikwe, Kumi, Namayingo. So we've done monitoring ever since this framework came into existence and we feel as an organization but also from the community that we serve that the framework is not pro poor because first and foremost when you look at these study materials, Mr. Patrice has rightly said that they printed 25%. So 25% means that it's for some sections of people. The area where I come from, I was just having a chat with him before we started that. I live in Matunga, not far away from the capital. And there are many people from that area who are poor, but they've never received the materials. And when, uh, secondly, when you look at radio and TV, there was a presumption, I think, on the side of government that everyone has access to a TV set or they have radio, or they'll use their phones to be able to, uh, to follow the discussions or to follow the lessons. So with that, you find that, and there are situations like when COVID came in and we went through uh, a lockdown, there are people who had jobs or who had businesses, but as a result of the lockdown, they fell into uh, 
uh, that's uh, that section of people who are poor. So you find that that there were those who were poor and there are those who became poor after the lockdown. And with such a framework and having materials, 25%, uh, and also having programs on TVs and radios, it's a good initiative. But we know that there are many people that do not have access. It's a luxury for them. Yes. And from our monitoring reports, uh, the other thing that we found some of these materials, when they reached the districts, the local councils are asking between 5,000 to 7,000 for you to access. Are they asking for money? Yes. But we are being told that this is entirely free. Oh. Patrice will pitch in. Go ahead. Of course, we are being told that it's free, but the monitoring reports that are coming from, uh, for example, we received reports from Bale Sub County, which is in Kayunga District, mm -hmm. that uh, the local council in those areas are asking people for money, between 5,000 and 7,000. And in other situations, for some parents who didn't get, because uh, Patrice said that they printed 25%, uh, so for other people who didn't get the materials, they have to go and photocopy. And these are, you know, big volumes where people do not have money and you expect them to do such photocopies. So with that and uh, other issues, I think it is not proper. Do such circumstances increase the inequality gap with, uh, in our educational system in Uganda between the rich and the poor? Definitely, yes. So those who have, when you look at the education sector now, people, for example, from private uh, schools mm -hmm. or from well-to-do families, the schools are innovating, you know, they are using ICT, they are using G Suit, G Classroom, WhatsApp and Zoom and so many other things to ensure that kids keep learning. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> the children from disadvantaged communities, the marginalized communities, do n these are luxuries. They do not have, you know, smartphones that you and I have. They do not have, you know, these computers and tablets where they'll be able to get uh, some of these materials. Not because they don't want to, but they have no choice. They have no choice. Right. Yeah, so that exhibits, you know, mm. the gap between the rich and the poor, those mm. who have and those who don't have. All right, Mr. Patrice Sembrige, let, you're going to hint on what she said. She did mention that people are paying for these learning materials, yet we were promised, especially by your director at the National Curriculum Development Center, Ms. Grace Baguma, that they were entirely free. I remember having an interview with her, and she promised me no one will be asked for a single dime to purchase these learning materials. But we are seeing something entirely different, Mr. Patrice. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it's really very unfortunate that uh, uh, some Ugandans are doing a disservice to the younger citizens by selling these materials. The principle in which these materials were developed and the position of the Ministry of Education and Sports, these materials were to be distributed to all students at no cost, entirely free. Now, as you know, our people there in the community, they take all of the opportunities to reap where they have not, you know, put an effort. And this is very common. These are, you know, that it's criminal mm. to, 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 to print these materials and sell them. Because one, they don't have the copyright. Two, they are not the, 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 the developers of the material. Two, they are not representing the ministry. So when they start selling the materials, that is criminal. And do, you, do you believe, Mr. Patrice Sembirige, that this is the main reason why we've seen a slow distribution of learning materials in the country because of this corruption? Um, the distribution, uh, first and foremost, um, as I mentioned, uh, that w w our target was to reach all the, s the 12 million yes. students. Mm -hmm. But when we printed the materials and the resources that we had could not sufficiently cover mm -hmm. the entire population. Mm -hmm. Now, that group of people took the advantage that the materials were not adequate and they grabbed the materials, photocopied them, reprinted, and started selling, you know, exploiting the poor Ugandans. But as, as uh, any CDC, as a ministry, that was not our position. These materials were entirely printed mm. for free mm -hmm. at no cost. However, there were some people like members of parliament mm. who offered it to reprint for their people in, the, in their constituencies and were giving them also out at no cost. Mm. So to answer your question in, in conclusion, 
that was not our position. And up to now, even the materials that we are developing, they are not for sale. They are going to be distributed at no cost to all the students in the country. Now, Mr. Patrice Mbirige, let's talk about another issue. Has the Ministry of Education, in conjunction with the National Curriculum Development Center, undergone some kind of review of this framework since its, uh, its commencement, yes, and uh, since its inception, by the way, and the commencement of the implementation process? Did you undertake any kind of review as Ministry of Education and NCDC? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, you know, in the first phase of developing the remote learning materials, we had a framework which guided the whole entire process. And as I talk now, we are in the second phase. Mm -hmm. In the first phase, we, we focused on content which, has been, uh, which had been already covered. We are mm -hmm. doing some kind of revision. Now, in the second phase, we are covering new content. So to that effect, we had to revise our framework. So we have a, fr a new framework. Amazing. Which is uh, now guiding the whole process on the second phase. Because in the, in, in, here we are looking at content for term two and term three, and possibly some topics or content which was not covered in term one. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are focusing on new content, we couldn't, you know, we, there, there was need to review our approach. That's why we had to look at our guidelines, the framework, and see how best do we carry on this new process. Because now, uh, the students are going to learn the content, which is new, and we had to come up with uh, a new approach. How do we package? How do we reach out to other students? What other ideas do we need to embed in this framework w such that these materials and this phase is very successful? Mm -hmm. So the review was was done and the framework is there in place uh, and the, the process is ongoing mm -hmm. of developing new materials. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, let me also bring in Nakulima Safina, the program's officer at the Initiative for Social and Economic Rights. Uh, Nakulima, let's talk about the issue of the challenges. What do you think are some of the opportunities and challenges for this framework uh, on uh, continued learning? Um, the framework on continued learning, mm. I think one of the opportunities is to ensure that that the, the learners continue learning because learning should not stop because they are emergencies. Right. And this means that uh, once the learners continue learning, you know, they are catching up on the syllabus, they are being kept busy, and they are not dropping out of school because we have an emergence. Because uh, in the different media, we've seen that perhaps some learners who have not been uh, catered for mm. with these learning materials went into other things. We've seen cases of uh, people who have been defiled. We've seen cases of pregnant girls in Luka, over 70 of them, and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. continued learning in itself, once well done, mm -hmm. it is a good initiative. However, on the other side, like I mentioned, I, I think largely what I'm here to speak about is not more about me as a person, mm -hmm. but information that we've received from the community, mm -hmm. especially regarding the challenges. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges, um, was about um, the reach or access of the learning materials not everyone received. Yet everyone was supposed to continue learning. So, uh, like uh, Mr. Sembirige has said that they printed 25%. I think uh, in a way that he said they didn't have resources, but I think that was grossly wrong mm. because we needed to keep everyone on board. And everyone on board, people in private schools, like I mentioned, some of them have been covered. But there are areas where the 25% did reach. And what happens, people start going into, you know, um, digging, and then they end up, you know, girls end up getting pregnant, and so on and so forth. And then secondly, from our monitoring, uh, the other issue was, you know, when the government has a policy on learning in local languages for the lower primary. Mm -hmm. However, ma the materials that were printed, and Mr. Patrice can uh, allude to this, were printed in English. So if a child has been learning in Luganda or Lusoga, and then you send them revision materials, mm -hmm. 
in a language that they were not learning. Are they learning? Mm -hmm. Are they understanding? Remember, there is no one to tell them, oh, this is this, this is this. Mm -hmm. And uh, coupled with that, we find that in most of these areas where the 25% was sent, we have parents who are illiterate. Yes. They know nothing or very little about what their children so are So they learning. won't be able to aid their young ones Yes, in their they studies. won't be able to, you know, to aid their young mm. ones. And uh, still from the community, especially um, the reports that we are coming out of the media, but also from our monitoring uh, work, children with disabilities, especially the deaf and the blind, mm. they have not received mm. uh, materials that they can use in braille form. So what is being sent is for you and me who can hear, who can see, and so on and so forth. So what happens to them? Because they had to revise. And we are working under the presumption uh, uh, that the materials that we are sent for children to revise, all children had covered whatever is being sent within the six, uh, the six weeks that uh, Mr. Patrice is talking mm -hmm. about. We know there are schools that are always slow in doing these things. So once you send these materials, what happens? Mm -hmm. So the children with disability from all parts of this country have, you know, they've been crying out. We've not received materials. Mm -hmm. We've not received these materials in braille form. So they are being left out uh, in as far as this is uh, concerned. But also I think one of the things we don't have to forget, and it's a big challenge, you cannot uh, forget to talk about the issues of poverty because this is one of the, uh, the vulnerability issues in mm -hmm. as far as education is concerned. We're going to throw it to Patrice. How best can we help <laughs> such families? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> many, ma many areas yes. people are poor. Like we said in the beginning, mm -hmm. people are poor. And so there are issues of we've not gotten material. We mm -hmm. cannot print. We don't have money to, you know, uh, get radios. We, like everyone is like, we do not have. Mm -hmm. And you would understand given that we are in a very uh, uncertain time. So the issue of... Uh, Ma getting materials for everyone, ensuring that everyone is being covered, is something that we need to think about as a country. Wait a minute, Ms. Nakulima Safina. You're telling me the reason we've been seeing high rates of pregnancies, teenage pregnancies, high rates of child labor, all that is all to the fact that some students did not get learning materials to a certain and were not kept busy. To, to a certain extent, I would say yes, because when you look at the districts where uh, media reports coming in uh, to the effect that, you know, many girls were found pregnant, Koboko, Hoima, ISIS, uh, Luka, and so on and so forth, mm. those are some of the places that perhaps did not get the 25%. Mm. And because these kids are not in a, an environment, a school environment that is keeping them busy, what happens next? Mm -hmm. They are just moving around and then before the, before you know they are pregnant mm -hmm. yes uh, mr patrice is there a plan from the minister of education and national curriculum development center to ensure that the learners who have actually resorted to child labor to make ends meet if the family is saying we do not have any money you have so many children on the farm working on behalf of the parents so such children are likely dropouts. The young future mothers who have gotten pregnant during this lockdown, these are the future mothers we are talking about. Is there a plan to keep these future mothers in school after the lockdown and so forth, and also the boys and girls who have dropped out as a result of child labor? Yeah, thank you very much. Mm. Um, let me talk about briefly about uh, what uh, Madame was, uh, uh, raised on the issue of um, the children with disabilities. Yes. Yeah, is, is she rightly mentioned, you know, when we're developing the materials in the first phase, it was kind of a crash program. Right. And uh, when you are dealing with such uncertainties and, and, and education and emergencies, really the word emergency, you are not prepared for, for all, the, all, the pro, all of that is likely to, to unfold mm -hmm. in the process. So we developed the, the materials to cater for the children with the different impairments. And I can, I can share an example here. We, we, did, we, we, we had to take the initiative to develop uh, the self study material for the blind. This is the braille material. And also, this braille material, so it was twin one, also mm. for the, those with low vision. Mm. Did they all receive? Now, that's where I'm coming. Mm. Uh, now, we, we, we did, with the resources we had we were able to develop this material. Yes, sir. Now, the challenge was the multiplier effect. 
how do we reproduce, to reach out to all these students who need the material? This is, was our major hiccup. And up to now, we are still going ahead to the Braille to, to produce materials for all those learners with mm -hmm. different impairments. Mm -hmm. But I want you to agree with me. These things require a lot of money. And at the moment, as we are struggling with this pandemic, it's quite, you know, a challenge that we are not hitting the target. So people out there who can, because these materials are already in our bookshelf and we are producing more, but now to reproduce it is quite expensive. And of, of course, Nakulima also mentioned that uh, some of these materials is in English. And yeah. you have some learners who only yes. are cognizant of maybe Lutoro, Lunyoro, exactly. Luganda, and so forth. Yes. Uh, in the first phase, uh, for lower primary, we're not able to translate the materials. But later on, we, we got some support. And as I talk now, we are translating these materials into local, langu into local languages. So we shall be able to, to, to provide the learners w in lower section with materials in, in the, w I, I, I printed in the familiar languages, mm -hmm. not English this mm -hmm. time around. All right, I'm afraid we've run out of time. We are going to take a very, very short break, but then I'm coming back on that issue of how best we can keep the future mothers in school, those who have gotten pregnant during the lockdown, and also the boys who have dropped out to help their parents to make uh, ends meet. You're still watching NTV, uh, NTV Uganda. We are talking about the continued learning in the wake of COVID-19. Has it had the desired effect on the learners it is targeting? Let's take a very short break. We'll be right back with more of this particular topic. Welcome back to NTV Uganda and thank you for staying with us. Of course, right here on the show, we are expounding on the status of continued learning during the coronavirus pandemic, leaving no one behind. Have we left anyone behind when we introduced this new framework uh, that will aid students with their continued learning? And what are the challenges plaguing continued learning as it is? The material is there, but is there a will from the students to read the material? There is a lot of uncertainty. They do not know when they will get back to school. Those are so many challenges, but I have uh, Patricia Mbirige, uh, a curriculum specialist from the National Curriculum Development Center. He is also joined by uh, Safina Nakulima. She's a programs officer at the uh, initiative at Social Initiative for Social and Economic Rights right there. Both gentlemen and lady are in studio with me at this opportune moment. Let me bring you in, Mr. Patrice Sembirige. We're talking about the issue of poverty. Many parents have had a lot of economic consequences, so they resorted to using their children on their farms. That is child labor. Young girls who did not get these learning materials have gotten into some precarious relationships that have led to teenage pregnancies that are on the rise. So in a nutshell, we are talking about future mothers after this lockdown is lifted, is there any plan from the Ministry of Education, from the National Curriculum Development Center, to actually keep these young people who are from poor backgrounds in school? Uh, thank you very much, uh, mm. moderator. Um, uh, 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 let's define child labor. Mm. Uh, because uh, you are saying children who are, uh, who are working on the farms. If, if I the farms are only part of the story. I could give you some genus, tell you to go to the street to sell. The farms are literally I, 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 part I of the think, story. I think uh, on a, in a general perspective, mm. uh, children have to do, uh, you know, work at home, uh, depending on the setting of the family. Mm -hmm. You know, we have uh, the three communities in Uganda. We have the rural community, we have the sub urban community, and then the urban community. The lifestyles in those three categories is quite different. So you find that, uh, um, uh, you find that in the one cohort, children help parents in the different activities at home. Mm -hmm. Either taking the animals to graze, going to the garden, uh, that one cannot be regarded uh, as child labor. I understand, Mr. Patrice, but <laughs> if that used to happen even before the lockdown, but yes. at a lower level, yes. like a child that wants to help or aid the parent. But now, it's not, I'm not going to say by force, but they are being forced by the situation to be on the firms with their parents. They are being forced to go to the streets without the help or the supervision of the parents. 
What do you make of all that? Yes, you, you have mentioned the poverty. Mm. And the poverty, you know, is of different degrees. Mm -hmm. And different families and communities tackle it in different perspectives. So if a, a parent, uh, you know, prepares maize or whatever and gives mm -hmm. a child to stand by the roadside to, to sell to the people who are passing by, uh, you know, there are extremes. I agree with mm -hmm. you where there is actually child labor. But in the general perspective, children and uh, we look at uh, our Uganda as a country, mm -hmm. the setting, as a minister of education, of course, we condemn that. And it, in, if you look at our curriculum, we have topics which talk about child labor, mm -hmm. what are the problems and what are the you know, issues around it. Mm -hmm. We don't you know, condone it. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, what is going to happen uh, in the near future, we, we, we are looking at sensitizing the parents. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, reminding them about their roles, about child rearing, mm -hmm. about all those things. How, how do they come up with the... Uh, how do they look after the children? Mm -hmm. Reminding them about their chi the, the rights of children, mm -hmm. uh, looking at how should the, a child, you know, be cared for to grow in, mm -hmm. a, in, a, in the right way mm -hmm. and be a responsible citizen. Mm -hmm. So sensitization is one of the key issues that has to be to going To sensitize on the, parents. the parents. But then, Mr. Patrice, what and about a parent who is doing all the factors you've just mentioned, but then that parent is grappling with one thing, poverty. And that parent is so concerned that when the lockdown is lifted, schools reopen, that parent won't be able to send this, uh, the, the learner to school. So we are asking, how can that parent be helped? You get the point? Yes. And now, um, of course, as I've mentioned, mm -hmm. poverty is of different magnitudes. And the, at the moment, with the global pandemic, COVID-19, Many, you know, businesses, many economic activities of different people in all those settings have been crumpled. They are, they are not doing well. So they have to find all the ways to meet ends meet. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion here, uh, I think community engagement, I think uh, Parents have to, you know, previously, you, you, Ugandans are, are used to, mm. we used to think within the box. Right. And then a, t a time came when people were thinking without the box. Mm. Uh, <laughs> then uh, thinking uh, outside the box. Mm. So what we are talking about today is thinking when there's no box. Mm. Uh, thinking without the box. Not thinking outside the box. Because that, t that time has long passed. So th the parents have to be helped. Mm. How do they think without a box mm. to mitigate such a difficult situation mm. and also to help them plan that the, you know to prepare for eventualities true yes all right we also do have the programs officer at the initiative for social and economic rights and that's none other than nakulima safina uh, yes let's talk about the challenges yes from a civil society perspective safina do you see any challenges with this continued learning process during the lockdown we said, uh, like I said before the break, um, there are challenges that the community is facing with the continued uh, mm. learning program, and the government needs to listen more to the community. I believe we talked about the program before the break. Right now, let's talk about the, this, the process of continued learning, not the framework from the ministry, but the whole process of continued learning. So the process of mm. continued learning, some of uh, the challenges that I can talk about, mm. uh, one, which ties in with what uh, I said earlier. Mm. So I it's hard to draw a line between them. Mm. One of them is the lack of um, interaction between the learner and... That direct interaction. Yes, the direct interaction. Because like I mentioned, students are at different levels. Mm. There are those who covered some of the things. There are those who are behind schedule. And they need a teacher to be able to, like once they've not understood, they should be able to go and ask 
which privileges some of uh, the students or uh, our children who go to private schools have because their videos, you send in questions and then they are able to respond and say this is this. Mm. So that is one of the, uh, the biggest challenges. Because it beats the purpose of a test if you're not going to be corrected when you're wrong. Yes, All and right. it also takes us back to a very valid question of uh, children learning during this continued learning mm. uh, program because that's one of the things we need to assess because we don't want a situation where kids go back to school and government is very uh, confident that we send out materials kids were learning so they expect them to be at a particular level and then once they are back into the school routine they did not understand anything because there was no one you know to interact with to say I've not understood how do I do this and also one other thing that I don't want us to forget is uh, with regards to the TV and radio programs Still, you'll be, uh, for example, with uh, the radio program, still the teacher is talking, 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 but the child who has not understood cannot be able to say, oh, I've not understood this concept. Mm. And so it brings in issues of, uh, I know it's an emergency like Mr. Patrice said, but are we helping or is there a, a better way that we can be able to do this? And then uh, the other problem uh, that there is... Um, you find that when you look at the TV and radio programs, if I, for example, I have, if I have four children in, in my home, how do, how do they do the division of, you know, you have one radio set, you have one TV set, mm. and then there are programs on TVX and programs on TVY, mm. you know, with colliding programs. How does that happen, you know, for uh, families that have more than one? But also uh, part of the reports that we've received uh, in some of these areas where parents do not even appreciate the issue of continued learning, you find a situation where a parent, a mother wants to watch a soap, and then there is a program for learning, and the child is saying, the learner is saying, I cannot learn because my mom or my dad wants to watch football or mm. they want to watch this. Mm. So there are also issues of... Competing uh, for resources. Yes, competing for resources that are available, which are greatly affecting the children. But I think it also stems from, you know... Uh, parents do not appreciating this whole uh, thing of continued learning. What about the students themselves? We are getting the uh, reports that they, they are losing morale because of the uncertainty. They do not know when they will get back to school, so reading is becoming a problem. You know how students are. If there is an, a test in a month, a student will be reading two weeks to the test. But then here they are. They do not know when they will get back to school, so that means reading has become a problem. What message do you have for, the, for these students? Um, of course, from still from our monitoring work as the mm. Initiative for Social and Economic Rights, we've interfaced with students who have really uh, informed us that they are mentally disturbed. And that is something that still the ministry will have to look into because mm. you cannot teach someone who is not read in their mind. But also, uh, as a parent in my house, I have a child who has issues of when are we going back to school and once those materials are out there and you say oh there is this you need to look at this like but mommy when are we going to go back to school so he's a little bit relaxed you know to read because in his head he thinks it's going to be a mm -hmm. dead year so right uh, like you mentioned that there is need to look into uh, um, the mentor or um, the mind of these learners are they ready to do the continued learning? Mm -hmm. Are there some programs that we can have for them to prepare them or to ease you know, the uncertainty that is happening around mm -hmm. them? So a, one parent can be able to talk uh, to their kid about the future of their learning. There are parents who don't even understand or they don't even care whether schools open or they don't cope. Like they're already frustrated. So those are some of the issues that mm -hmm. uh, I think government also needs to look into. Another issue, Mr. Patrick Sembinige, you did mention, we are going to be talking about the uh, second uh, edition of the framework on the, from the uh, Minister of Education, but then the first edition that you produced, you said that it covered only 25% of the learners. So what happened to the 75% of the learners? Does that mean that they miss out on those learning materials? And if they did, here you are introducing a new phase of the uh, Minister of Education framework on continued learning. Yes, the first one, revision. Now you did mention, what, what are you bringing on board, Mr. Patrice, in the second? Uh, new content. New content. Now, this is new content for someone who did not receive the first content. How are you going to navigate all this and ensure that this time around, all learners 
are actually going to get these learning materials. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, in the first phase, you have right to say mm. we, 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 we didn't cover all the students. Mm. But uh, in remote learning, we don't use one mode. We use a number of modes. For example, what uh, we are talking over 25 percent was that was the print version, the hard copies. But then also we had the radio lessons, we had the television lessons, and then we, we put these materials for students who could access internet on our, on our, our websites and uh, online. So all these were different avenues of accessing the materials. So you may find that as we're talking of, of 25 percent, in fact. The 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 the, 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 po the population that was reached mm. was you know much higher than this because of other modes of learning mm. that, that, that 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 we 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 use in remote learning. Um, so that's how I can quickly answer that. How that will the implementation of the second phase be? Let us in. Uh, yes, the implementation of the second phase. Yeah, we did a review and we, we 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 there are many lessons that we learned from the first phase, and uh, this time around we have tried to mitigate so that he such uh, challenges do not uh, reoccur. Um, as I've said, we are focusing on new content for term two and term three. First and foremost, when you look at the, f the framework, is emphasizing the principle of simplicity, whereby the materials, if, uh, if a topic is developed, uh, we look at moving from known to unknown, simple to complex, where a concept is being developed in a, in a gradual manner, so that in, a, in, in such a way that a student is able to capture over 70 percent right. of, of what we are covering mm. yes all right uh let me also are you done i'd like to bring in nakulima uh maybe i can add on one thing which you yes. which you talked of in the in the in the, the previous question mm. about the young mothers mm. how uh, can we ensure that we keep them uh, in yes schools? how do we keep Wonderful. them in school yes. <laughs> now you find that uh, um this covid 19 has really caused a lot of uh, uh, challenges in our communities uh, many younger uh, girls, uh, primary and secondary, and whichever, uh, you know, they are pregnant, uh, certain mm. number. Madame Nakulima is talking of over 70 in Iluka, Kalilo, and other districts in the country, mm. which is really a disaster. Mm. So I, I think uh, the policies are clear. Uh, and you know it very well. Mm. Uh, primary schools and secondary schools have not been uh, admitting uh, young girls who are pregnant. But now it's high time for us to go back on the drawing board. And revisit. And revisit, mm. to review some of these policies. Because these are younger people. If we take an, uh, uh, all over the country that uh, about uh, 150 girls have been impregnated and they are, they are between the age of 15 and 17, you know, this is quite a big number Indeed. to be left out to go into the wild and the, 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 the fathers or there would be people who are concerned are not nowhere to be seen mm. so, so we should revisit the policy so uh, I, i'm looking at revising the policy to see if we can in, in, you know have these students either in school f finding certain you know principles and guidelines how mm. we can you know bring them back into school mm. but the policy is clear if somebody is in that state i think in primary or secondary it's a different story Okay. So the issue mm -hmm. here is reviewing the policies to, to, to see how we handle the, the new challenges which have come with mm -hmm. this pandemic 19. Safina Nakulima, what do you think government should do to ensure that no child is left behind during this process on continued learning? Um, uh, one of uh, the things I think government needs to do is um, to review the frameworks having everyone on board consulting with different stakeholders because one of the things that I don't agree with from Mr. Sembirige is uh, saying that they use different modes to ensure that this continued learning happens. He said 25% were self-study material, then they had other modes. But we know that even with the other modes, there are people who are falling within the cracks. And we are talking about not leaving anyone behind with this program of continued learning. Mm -hmm. So once we consult with the different stakeholders, the learners themselves, the parents from all walks of life, and all other people, we consult with them and we see how do we make sure that the second phase that uh, NCDC plus, the Ministry of Education is bringing out, do not have certain categories of people being left out. That is very key. And then uh, secondly, there is need for government Ministry of Education, NCDC, already they are, there is money that has been earmarked. We've seen in social media, we've seen on a main, uh, plat I mean main, uh, mainstream media money that has come to do certain things within the education sector 
uh, that have been affected uh, as a result of the COVID-19 mm. pandemic. Because when I sit here and I listen to Mr. Sembirige saying that, you know, they have the material for children with disability, but money for reproducing it is still a problem. It perturbs because by every day things are coming up. So there is need for the money that has been earmarked for certain things to be channeled to those things such that, for example, we are not leaving children with disability because we are waiting on a development partner to give us money to be able to reprint this for children with disability. If the money doesn't come through, what is the plan B? Where is the priority on this? Can we have money, resources, uh, internally uh, generated resources? Do you believe the money is there, but it's uh, only a problem of priorities? From what we've gotten so mm -hmm. far from the media, you know, there is money that has been given for the sector, you know, for the education sector, not mm -hmm. for all other sectors, like uh, he said that the pandemic has process. affected. Mm. But for this process, so we need to sit down and, you know, follow that money bit by bit. But also, I think the other thing that we need to do, uh, which is very, very key as, uh, as a nation, is to raise awareness about the importance of continued learning during such situations. Mm. Because not all parents even understand what is happening. And I think it's because maybe there is communication gap, awareness is not to the level that we expect, and people do not understand. That's why you find parents not being involved uh, in this. So it is very key for us to raise awareness to make mm. sure that the parent understands why should your child continue learning during uh, 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 amazing, a situation amazing. like this. Mr. Patrice yes. Sembirige, yes. what is the plan to harness the gains we've made during this lockdown? What do I mean by the gains? We have adopted e-learning. We are talking about long distance learning. We are talking about continued learning. We are talking about remote learning, which ideally means the same thing. But you understand the adoption of e-learning. Yes, how can we harness those gains even after the lockdown so that we can revert to the use of technology? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, le let me just say something about what uh, Madam Harima has just mentioned. On but we have nine minutes to end oh, the show. Now, with, mm -hmm. the, with the, 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 the brain materials, in the second phase, we, we, we have catered for them. So mm -hmm. we, we, it will not be in the, like in the, it was in the first phase. There will be something different about that. Mm -hmm. um, now it is high time in, in, in the education sector and all the education system in Uganda to embrace ICT, mm. that's e-learning. Let's give them results. As a lesson. Because uh, uh, for many of us have been living in the classical period whereby some of the things have not been applied. Now it is now high time to gradually in our education system to open all the channels of learning. So, and one of them that is very critical is um, e-learning. And how are you going to do that? Of course, uh, we, shall st uh, we have already started you know, looking at the curriculum, already digitalizing some of the content. Mm -hmm. The process started uh, even before the pandemic. So we have to continue with the same and then come out to, 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 to build the capacity of the teachers, of school leaders, and the process will continue as going forward, mm -hmm. yes. Ms. Naklima, do you believe the adoption of e-learning technologies can be a new culture in Uganda that can be accepted by Ugandans? Remember, poor people might have no choice not to accept. Um, thank you very much. But you get what I mean? Yes, mm -hmm. I get what you mean. Mm -hmm. So it will be accepted to the extent um, for parents who have. Mm -hmm. Still, there are issues that government will have to look into as the policy comes on board for e-learning. Spell it out for Patrice. He's here. How mm. do we ensure mm. that those who cannot access the tools mm. for e-learning are covered? Because you can come up with a policy, but if you do not go ahead to think about that other person, the other side, who is going to be... Um, let me, say, let me use the word hostel because they do not have the resources to, uh, to have a tablet unless you're providing all the tools that are required for e-learning. But that is a welcome idea as long as they don't leave anyone behind mm -hmm. uh, in developing the policy for e-learning. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Patrice, let's talk about recommendations in these last five minutes. What would be your immediate recommendations on continued learning to develop continued learning in Uganda moving forward? Recommendations from you and uh, now, uh, Safina and uh, wrap up. Uh, in our second phase, uh, we are finding that uh, since we have new content, 
uh, one of our major recommendations is to start uh, what we call a color center at National Cultural Development Center mm -hmm. to support, uh, reinforce learning for learners, parents, and teachers. They can, you know, wherever they are, you know, calling in and sending SMSs to support on the content, to ask questions. So that's one of the major recommendations so that we can mm -hmm. see how, moving forward. How do we reach out to all the communities? Now, if we started with the NCDC call center, we can, you know, go on, you know, you know, establishing more in the different regions. Say so that that one now is uh, one of the. So explain to us how the how that process works. I'm a parent. Uh, I'm on my phone, and I'm telling you in Kampala we do not have e-learning materials. And then you bring them. No, 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 not as such. Uh, help uh, us understand. Uh, you know, when the students are in their locations, mm -hmm. and the call center is, for example, here at the NTB, right? And we have some teachers or specialists in, the, in, the, in the, at, at that station at that time. Mm -hmm. You know. Either we partner with some either M10 or to give us zero, maybe uh, zero right. rate on, mm -hmm. on calls and whatever. So that whatever somebody has a challenge, has issues to ask about any, anything concerning learning, they can number. reach out mm -hmm. to the experts to give advice or to assist in any way possible. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's about the student who needs The student, help. the learner, and the teacher. I'm working on a test. I'm yeah. having problems. I need correction. So I just get on this hotline, toll-free, yes, yes. call an official, you're reading, and I'm helped. Yeah, you're reading the material. You're doing some research. You're doing some simple experiment, but you need more guidance and, you know, you, you call in and we, we give the, 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 the assistance instantly. How do you plan to harmonize the congestion? Because you and I know very well <laughs> that hotline <laughs> will be pummeled 24-7. You saw the case when we gave yeah. uh, DCs the mandate to yeah. allow people to move during the lockdown. I you understand. saw what happened I to understand. the call centers and the RDC's Yo, residences. Uh, so this time around, how the, do you plan to harmonize? With any innovation, you, mm. you must, you know, anticipate for the challenges mm. and plan how you meet again. All right. Yes. Ms. Nakulima, yeah. as we wrap up, Safina, any recommendations for our dear government moving forward? in a way to develop continued learning? Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, the government needs to do everything in their powers, like we mentioned, resource to improve the continued learning because in the circumstances, that's what we have. And in such uncertain times, we need to keep the doors of learning open such that we do not have uh, these challenges that are stopping people mm -hmm. from learning and in doing so we should um, the government should ensure that there is access inclusivity for every child regardless of who they are and where they are coming from yes Thank you. All right, and with that, we've come to the end of this conversation. We were talking about the status of continued learning during the coronavirus pandemic, leaving no one behind. Have we left anyone behind? That has been the $64,000 question that has been answered by Patrice Sembirige, the uh, curriculum specialist at the National Curriculum Development Center, and also Safina Nakulima, who is the program officer at the Initiative for Social and Economic Rights. So we are telling you, Please, the students continue learning even though the learning materials do not come to you or your district, you can still uh, embark on self-studying, doing it on your own so that when the materials find you, you're already in the know. Yes, you have a wealth of information. My name is Romeo Busiku. Many thanks for having made the time to actually watch this show. I'll be back here at 1 p.m. for another update on the day's developing stories. Good afternoon.